I want to welcome you to this evening's ArtWise, a virtual exploration of the exhibition, Mediterranean American Art from the Graham D. Williford Collection. On the surface, Mediterranean is an exhibition of American visions of the Mediterranean region. The exhibition features paintings, prints, drawings from the 1840s to about the 1920s of sites and cities throughout Italy, Spain, Egypt, Tunisia, Lebanon, and Palestine. Tonight, we will examine works from the exhibition and delve a little deeper into the significance of the time frame these works were created while examining the global trends and historic events that made these artworks possible and also recognizing that these picturesque images of peoples and places and landscapes from the 19th century and the 20th century tend to color our contemporary perspectives and understandings of these regions today. All of the works in this exhibition are on loan from the Jean and Graham DeVoe Williford Charitable Trust. And they represent the collecting visions of one person, Graham Williford. Graham Williford was an art collector from Fairfield, Texas, who first began collecting in the 1950s. He studied art at Columbia University, then served in the Navy during World War II. And after the war, he found himself in Paris where he worked as a concert pianist. Ironically, it was while in France that Williford became profoundly interested in American art. As a collector, he was intrigued by Americans, not too dissimilar to himself, who worked and studied abroad. And during his lifetime, Graham Williford amassed a collection of over a thousand paintings, drawings, and works on paper by significant American artists and lesser known figures from the 19th and 20th centuries. Although this exhibition covers areas surrounding the Mediterranean Sea, when looking at the works on view in Mediterranean, you can see Williford's particular interest in Italian landscapes. Of the 72 works featured in the exhibition, 50 captured the sights and scenes of Venice, Capri, Naples, Rome, and the Italian countryside. So Italy had long been a magnet for artists. Beginning in the late 16th century though, it became fashionable for young aristocratic white men to visit Italy as part of their formal upbringing. The Grand Tour, as it became known, was part of this social fabric of aristocratic Europe. It was something of like a rite of passage for a privileged class who traveled seeking exposure to classical antiquities and cultural gems of Europe. Have you ever wondered why certain tourist destinations, especially those in Europe, are so popular today? The Grand Tour introduced this notion, this modern day notion of tourism. It was the first time people traveled just for the sake of traveling, curiosity, and learning. The Grand Tour was primarily an educational experience in its time where young men, mainly young men from England, earned a classical education by traveling to cultural centers in France and Italy and studying French and Italian art, architecture, music, and languages. Although the tour also permitted elements of let's just say 17th and 18th century equivalent of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, completion of the Grand Tour certified, quote, good taste and indicated a young man's official status as an aristocrat. These privileged young men typically ventured on year long journeys, crossing the English Channel to places like France or Belgium, where they then traveled with a tutor by stagecoach to Paris. There they stayed upwards of several months, studying French conversation, exploring art collections and architecture, and making day trips to places in the French countryside, like the Palace of Versailles. They then traveled across the Alps, sometimes by coach, or were carried by sedan chair, to places like Venice and Florence, to explore Italian churches and architecture, or to see masterworks by artists, Botticelli, Michelangelo, Donatello, all in person for themselves. 
Rome, however, was considered the ultimate travel destination for these grand tourists and provided a glimpse at numerous cultural resources, everything from Greco-Roman statues, ancient ruins, famous fountains, churches, private art collections, old masterworks, masterpieces of the high Renaissance, um, painting, sculpture, Sistine Chapel, frescoes, and so on and so on. And for the longest time, Rome itself was the southernmost point that these grand tourists would travel. But then excavations of places like Herculaneum in 1738 and Pompeii in 1748 introduced two further southern locations to these travelers who typically stayed and explored from a home base in Naples. Now these grand tourists typically traveled on average for a period of three and a half years. And when they returned home, they came with great stories of adventures, as well as crates of art, antiquities, and artifacts. And perhaps most importantly for the future development of tourism for American travelers, they brought with them journals and diaries of their firsthand travel accounts which on occasion were published and distributed to readers on both sides of the Atlantic, further fueling a general interest in travel. The Grand Tour, as it was just laid out, flourished until about the mid 19th century when rail transportation became more common. Steam powered transportation also changed travel for Americans, making adventures across the Atlantic cheaper to undertake safer, easier, and just more open to about anyone. So by the time American travelers arrived in Europe in larger numbers, the luxury of travel was no longer just limited to aristocratic privileged men. Unmarried women like Mary Cassatt and Cecilia Bohm, and American artists of color like Henry Osawa Tanner were all able to travel and study art in Europe in the 19th century. Other American artists, though, relied on wealthy patrons to travel. In 1901, American artist Abbott Thayer traveled to Italy with his family, spending about three months in Capri at the urging of his patron, Charles Freer, who owned a villa there in Capri. Thayer, in turn, thanked Freer for his generosity, creating this work the one here on that we can see here on the left for the art collector, the painterly study of which is on view in Mediterranea, which we can see here on the right. And although many Americans travel to destinations first laid out by the Grand Tour, their reasons for traveling typically differed to those of their European Grand Tourists. For Americans specifically, travel was essential for academic studies. Americans predominantly traveled to Europe to study in art schools because they didn't exist in the United States at the time. And not only did they find the premier art academies within Europe, they also found great opportunities to study alongside leading international artists of the day. American artists, when they traveled, brought with them canvases and sketchbooks to record notable sites, as well as paint their impressions of contemporary scenes and figures on local streets, harbors, and throughout the countryside. These views had rarely been documented or explored by most Americans. For Americans who had the luxury to travel, they brought back these canvases and sketchbooks, introducing foreign sites to Americans back home some also returned with actual significant artworks or skilled copies of European masterpieces for stateside artists to learn and study from, thus helping to spread and further establish arts within the United States. Fellow artist, Amer fellow American artist, um, Thomas Cole, for example, created this work, The Architect's Dream, which incorporates examples of Greek, Egyptian, Roman, and Gothic style architecture from his own travels and explorations throughout Europe and North Africa. 
And examples like this, artworks that were created, such experiences that were documented, went on to inspire architecture all throughout the United States, including probably most famously our nation's capital, whose architects also happened to study formally art and architecture in Italy. And all of these images and artworks that were brought back by American travelers, as well as the rise in publications about traveling merged at this time to help fuel Americans' overall desires to travel. Travel narratives typically included descriptions of unique monuments, sites, geography, and the general customs of these foreign lands. And although tales by travelers had existed for centuries, 18th and 19th century travel narratives were rather unique. Thanks in part to those technological improvements to roads and carriages and the ability to travel more by ship, more people in general were able to travel, thus just increasing the sheer number of travel publications. And for the first time, the popularity of travel books had outsold all other books throughout Europe and the United States, with the exception of the novel. But perhaps the most distinguishing characteristic of travel narratives at this time was how they blended factual information with literary content. Authors didn't merely record facts about the places that they had traveled. Travel narratives now needed to entertain readers, so they frequently included personal opinions or satirical reflections on a country's differences to their own, as well as contained imagined tales of adventure or fantasy. The author Mark Twain, his sixth travel book, A Tramp Abroad, detailed the adventures of two men as they made their way through places like Germany, Italy, and the Alps. The novel included accurate or relatively accurate depictions of scenery along the way, as well as rather imagined and humorous situations for these characters. The book also contained 328 illustrations, mainly created by the artist Walter Francis Brown, who was also included in the Mediterranean exhibition. In Twain's travelogue, The Innocents Abroad, the author recounted a seemingly more autobiographical description of his Mediterranean tour on the Quaker City steamship. The steamship advertised as an excursion to the Holy Land, Egypt, the Crimea, Greece, and intermediate points of interest. This book became Twain's most successful publication during his lifetime. But although the author wrote in the publication that travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, his descriptions at times appear to be just that. Twain described the Portuguese, for example, as, quote, slow, poor, shiftless, sleepy, and lazy, and Arabs from the Ottoman Empire as, quote, filthy, brutish, ignorant, unprogressive, superstitious. So although the resulting travel books enticed Americans to travel more abroad, the visions these narratives presented were largely skewed by this blending of truth with a biased fiction. Washington Irving's Tale of the Alhambra presented tale within tale, merging imaginary stories with the author's actual experiences in Spain. As a destination though, most Americans had never visited Spain prior to the US Civil War. So awareness of the country as a whole was mostly shaped by these literary novels, as well as images that were produced and released by British artists who were amongst the first foreign artists to be able to visit Spain. The artists and, and um, authors highlighted Spain's past, portraying somewhat dramatic scenes, um, specifically focusing in on Islamic monuments and architectural structures, um, 
and concocted these idyllic fantasies for their Western audiences. The images and stories circulated on both sides of the Atlantic, creating this perception, both real and imagined, of a country. So by the time American artists traveled to Spain, they sought similar sites and peoples that best presented this sense of difference, this otherness. They were intrigued by sites and peoples that could show Spain's centuries long blend of cultures, this blend of Catholic, Jewish and Islam Islamic religions. And although many American artists painted examples of Spain's Islamic architecture or sites that best represented its cultural past, at times there are works created by these American artists that express the fascination and admiration of a place, as well as reinforced certain stereotypes. So it may be interesting at this point to also point out that this reinforcement of difference or this reinforcement of otherness was also fairly apparent within American artist depictions of Italy at the time. It's the reason why when exploring the Mediterranean exhibition, you will see these um, images of ancient runes that are towering over um, you know, peasants within, um, within your near ground or you'll see um, you know, modern day sitters draped in togas surrounded by this ancient site. Basically by constantly depicting these sites of antiquities or illustrating the main differences from our own, American artists had degraded these places as lands of the past or these lands that expressed this distinct otherness. But perhaps nowhere is this sense of otherness more apparent than in the artworks from the time that depict Egypt, the Middle East, and the regions referred to as the Holy Land. European and Americans' fascination with Egypt had been ignited by Napoleon Bonaparte in 1798. The French occupation of Egypt lasted until about 1801, but the outcome of those three years is still reverberating today. Whereas previous colonial um, invasions had commonly been justified by religious arguments, the French occupation of Egypt was rationalized through a notion of reason and scientific exploration. For the first time in history, an army had set forth with military and academic intentions. They brought with them more than 200 artists, scientists, and scholars, as well as the scientific equipment and instruments, printing presses, and even over 200,000 research books. The artists and scientists and scholars that were brought along were meant to commemorate this expedition. They were meant to document Egypt's um, architecture, the peoples, the flora and the fauna, excavate actual historic sites, and even retrieve and bring back artifacts and specimens. So although the French occupation of Egypt was that short-lived period of about three years, it proved to be a significantly powerful influence on Western art and culture sparking this new enthusiasm for Europe, throughout Europe and the United States for all things Egyptian, this notion of Egyptomania. At the time, rediscovered Egyptian artifacts were rehomed and unveiled in museums throughout Europe and the United States. This being the Rosetta Stone, which was um, rediscovered by the French and is now um, in the home of the British Museum. Um, also at the time, fashionable women wore turbans or clothing that was inspired by Egyptian designs. And even buildings and statues or monuments were either transported directly from Egypt, as is the case with the um, monument in Paris that is shown here, 
or were actually built to replicate these Egyptian tombs like the monument in Washington, DC. So as all this is happening, obviously artists had turned and found to this new source of inspiration for their works in this quote, newly explored and newly discovered country. Many of these artists and topographers um, were amongst the first artists to depict Egypt, um, specifically French and British artists who at, originally came to Egypt for professional purposes, documenting antiquities or exploring, um, you know, accompanying explorers on scientific digs. And as travel became more accessible, American artists were also able to venture to Egypt accompanying scientific and archeological missions. In 1898, the American artist, Joseph Lyndon Smith, was invited to document Egyptian tombs by Phoebe Hurst, who underwrote the excavations at Giza, and by Dr. George Andrew Reisner, the director of the site at Giza, who later becomes the professor of Egyptology at Harvard University and the curator of the Egyptian collections um, at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. So Smith was amongst the you know, the scientists and the explorers, he was amongst these first people as an American artist to enter these newly rediscovered tombs. And in many cases, his paintings are the only surviving documentation of these newly explored fragile antiquities. But Smith kept a diary of his travels in Egypt and his memoir called Tombs, Temples and Ancient Art along with illustrations of his exploration in Egypt were published as firsthand accounts of the excavations. But by about the 1850s, artworks of the region transitioned from scientific imagery to this realm of fantasy. What emerged at the time were imagined images of a region and a style known in art as Orientalism. Ironically though, this time period also coincides with the introduction of photography and the ability for even these non-traveling American artists to have this opportunity to actually see actual settings and peoples. But what happens at this time is that most of these photographs that are brought back for American artists happen to be staged and present this imagined fantasy um, in their own sense, which overall doesn't seem to matter to most Western artists. In 1863, for example, the artist Elihu Vedder paints the first of this iconic series on the Great Sphinx at Giza. And he's gonna tackle this a couple of times throughout his career, but at this point, when he's creating this work, Vedder has not yet visited Egypt. So whether factual or imagined, Vedder relied on images of Egypt that appeared in these travel publications and these 19th century illustrations. And by including this figure of the Arab traveler in ragged clothes alongside the symbols that are supposed to question man's mortality, those symbols like the skull and the bones that you can see in these other versions of this work, it could be argued that Vedder was more interested in a sense of mysticism that Egypt appeared to possess for Western artists than in actually portraying Egypt as a whole. Even these seemingly simple depictions of Egypt, like Lockwood de Forest's painterly study seen here, portrays this rocky terrain of the Egyptian desert as a way of really emphasizing this sense of otherness of place and presenting Egypt as this mysterious setting. So some American artists who traveled to Europe also had the opportunity to study with the traditional French Orientalist painters. The American artist Eric Pape, for example, 
traveled throughout Egypt at the urging of his instructor, the well-known French Orientalist painter, um, Jean-Léon Jérôme. And although the work by Pape that's on view in Mediterranean and seen here on the left next to um, the work by his instructor there on the right, Pape's work here tends to demonstrate the artist's concern with light and time of day, but many of his works at the time did explore this more Orientalist style. Other American artists and Americans in general were exposed to Orientalist images and subjects at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. The exposition unveiled such incredible innovations as the Ferris wheel and the dishwasher and was thought of as this debut into the modern age. But amongst some of the most popular displays were these pavilions of belly dancers, mysterious Bedouins, and sumptuous bazaars, all seemingly replicating the Middle East, or at least Westerners' ideas of what the Middle East should be. Planners of the World's Fair envisioned this portion of the fair as this lesson in ethnography and human development. The villages were supposed to um, you know, provide visitors with this glimpse of, quote, primitive cultures that could directly contrast the, again, quote, civilization as presented within the city of Chicago. And amongst the American artists who exhibited at the Chicago World's Fair, 15 also happened to be included in the Mediterranean exhibition. And of those 15, the works of Lockwood de Forest, Julius Rochenfeld, um, George Peter Alexander Healy, Eric Pape, and William Turner um, Dannett featured this imagery that explored this um, travel and this sense of otherness. So images by American artists that circulated in the 19th and 20th centuries, including the works on display in the Mediterranean exhibition, in many ways cemented these perceptions of the Mediterranean region as one of scattered remains of antiquity, um, picturesque landscapes, historic or ancient landmarks, as well as exotic scenes and mysterious peoples, these notions for better or worse that continue to color our views of the region today. And with that, I would like to conclude um, leaving a little bit of time for Q&A. So as a kind reminder, um, please feel free to ask any questions about the Mediterranean exhibition um, or tonight's ArtWise lecture via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, I had the advantage um, in advance of tonight's program, we often get asked um, some of these kind of repetitive questions. Um, the first of it being, um, I noticed that several of the paintings in this exhibition have ornate gold frames. Are these the original frames? And the short answer is yes. Most of the works that you will see in the exhibition are indeed the original frames. Often the frames um, have this great way of mirroring the subject that is depicted within the artwork. Um, this work of the Roman aqueducts by um, Frederick Crowning Shield, for example, is surrounded by this pattern of laurel leaves, which is supposed to mirror that Roman setting within that painting. Um, or this work that we looked at a little bit ago by Joseph Lyndon Smith um, also mirrors the um, image that Smith created. Um, it's supposed to image the grooves that you would co commonly see with columns, um, as well as creating this kind of three-dimensional setting, almost like a diorama that is supposed to invite you as the um, viewer to almost step within the scene. Um, and kind of a funny story about the frames 
it is uh, not all of the frames um, came with the work. Some of them were actually um, shipped separately, giving the curatorial team here at The Hunter um, a little bit of a heart attack when we unpacked the works to see um, no painting and just a frame um, and wondering where the artwork might be. But um, it was all good. And we have a, a great uh, preparator team that was able to uh, frame these works in their original frames. Um, another question we often get asked is, did Graham Williford only collect American art? And the short answer to that is no. Um, although the bulk of Mr. Williford's collection did include works by American artists, um, including a lot of the works that we looked at this evening, um, Williford also collected European and American silver and decorative arts including um, these works uh, seen here, um, some of which are actually on display at the Dallas Museum of Art. And the um, last question that I know we had in advance um, was, um, you mentioned how American artists were inspired by European Orientalist painters. Um, were artists in the exhibition inspired by other art styles at the time? Also in short, yes. Um, so, as you noticed, the um, exhibition and what we discussed this evening covers a large time frame. The earliest works in the exhibition date from 1845, and the latest is going to be from 1921. So, not only is this, you know, a, a pretty significant period of time in terms of, of um, global events, it's also a pretty significant time, um, a pretty big time of change for American artists um, and the art scene as a whole. Um, several of the works in Mediterranean, as you can probably tell, followed that more um, academic or realist style. Um, but others have this more, um, you know, concentrated um, look at like atmosphere and time of day that would have mirrored the styles that we now call tonalism um, or impressionism. So this work, um, a pastel drawing by the American artist Charles Coleman, um, actually has an inscription on the back. There are two works by this artist that look very similar, and each of the um, works has a similar inscription uh, revealing the exact date and the time. So this one says February 9th, 1908 at 11am, and was the artist's way basically of tracking and recording the, um, you know, a similar locale, but mostly concerned about those kind of atmospheric differences um, within that locale. Um, also, interestingly, um, you know, this painting, this field of poppies by Julius um, Rolschulven is one of the first examples of Impressionism by an American artist um, created um, only a year after the French Impressionists um, reveal themselves as um, as the French Impressionists in France. Um, and similarly, this work here on the left by the American artist uh, Theodore Robinson um, shows how the artist followed in the footsteps of um, the French Impressionist, um, best known probably French Impressionist, Claude Monet, um, to create this almost near identical view of the same location in Bordighera, um, Italy. Um, other questions we received, um, there is a question if the um, collection has works by John Singer Sargent. Um, as far as I know, um, Graham Williford does not have a sergeant. Um, this exhibition does not have a sergeant, but it does have incredible works by people like Frank Duvenek and um, William Merritt Chase. Um, so it, it has a pretty incredible, a pretty wide array of, of some of the best known, um, you know, American 19th and early 20th century American artists. Um, so I really appreciate these questions and I hope you enjoyed this evening's program. Again, I want to thank 
um, our sponsor, as always, Martha Mackey, for her continued support of ArtWise programs, including tonight's virtual exploration and deeper dive into the exhibition, Mediterranean American Art from the Graham D. Williford Collection. And thank you again to everyone who joined us tonight. As a reminder, Mediterranean is going to be on view at the Hunter Museum through January 9th, uh, 2022. So we hope you enjoyed your evening. We hope that you come and explore this exhibition for yourself in the near future. And we hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you again. Good night. <laughs>